So, um, as, as mentioned, the, the, this presentation is titled Gender Bending the Mage, Early 20th Century Portuguese Occult Publishing and the Rise of Female Occult Reading. So this is about, um, this presentation is about a, a very specific, small offshot of the Portuguese tradition of the books of St. Cyprian. Uh, the books of St. Cyprian, for those who don't know, are basically just a, they're a, a literary tradition of Iberia and South America, and they're essentially grimoires. Uh, magic books, collections of sorceries and prayers attributed to St. Cyprian of Antioch. Now, St. Cyprian of Antioch is, in these geographical locations, the, the local magical hero. He corresponds to what in other areas of Europe or the world you would have um, King Solomon or Faust. In particular, uh, St. Cyprian. Um, the story of St. Cyprian is fictional. St. Cyprian of Antioch didn't exist. His story comes from three texts from the 4th century, which are essentially religious controversy texts meant to highlight the superiority of Christianity in comparison to pagan practices. St. Cyprian was supposed to be a, a pagan sorcerer who was hired to cast a love sorcery on a, a, a Christian maiden, but as she was a Christian and she knew the sign of the cross, this sorcery failed, and as a consequence, St. Cyprian ended up converting to Christianity and ended up, ended up being martyred. So, throughout history, you have that St. Cyprian becomes an ambiguous character in that he is both uh, called upon to protect an individual from uh, harmful magic and evil spirits, but equally called upon to aid in the practice of magic. In Portugal, we know that his name is associated to magical practice at least as early as the 16th century. The, the earliest reference I found is a, from a play by Gil Vicente where the name of St. Cyprian shows up in the summoning of a demon. And in regular magical practice, um, St. Cyprian is fairly uh, famous in uh, early modern Portuguese, what might be called urban folk magic, which is a particular style of magic mostly happening in, in large urban centers where he is uh, associated mainly with divination and, in particular, uh, hydromancy. Now, the books of St. Cyprian, the earliest reference we have to something of that name is from 1621, it's an Inquisition trial, and it's mentioned that this book was already 30 years old by the time the, the trial was happening, so from the late 16th century. But unfortunately, we don't have any of these early examples. The, the, the oldest version of this book we have is from the 18th century and it's essentially a, a magical treasure finding book. It's actually present right here at the University of Coimbra. So, it is in the 19th century that the books of St. Cyprian become, um, they go into the printing press, they become uh, a commercial object. Now, it, this, there's still a, a great confusion about this. We don't know the years when these books were published, we don't know their authors. We know some of the publishers, but one which stands out as probably the oldest printed version we know of, it's titled The, the True and Last Book of St. Cyprian, and this stands as a precursor to the more influential later versions of this book, such as The True Book of St. Cyprian, printed in Porto, and The Great Book of St. Cyprian, printed in Lisbon. These are all different books. Now. The Great Book of St. Cyprian is contemporarily what you would call the standard Portuguese version of the Book of St. Cyprian. The, the book that, if you walk into a Portuguese bookstore and they have Books of St. Cyprian, in all likeliness, it's going to be this version. Now, another literary tradition that exists parallel to the Books of St. Cyprian, which is influential and influenced by esoteric ideas, is that of prognostication books and almanacs. <coughs> The earliest uh, versions of these we know written in Portuguese are from the 14th century, and these uh, typically started off as very large, com mathematically complex books with um, l uh, uh, several instructions on how to calculate the positions of the stars and their influence on the sublunar world. But as time goes by, these start to become slightly more fragmented, and you end up having uh, yearly almanacs, which basically just presented the contents of these larger books as already resolved for the year in question. From the Inquisition records, we have examples of these both in manuscripts from the 17th century, and as we go on into the 18th century already in printed form, these 
smaller almanacs of a, a more of a of a folk appeal. <coughs> However, it is in the 19th century when the almanac culture really explodes into a remarkable uh, literary uh, tradition. In this century, around the same time when the books of Saint Cyprian were themselves being printed, is where you literally find hundreds of different titles of almanacs uh, being published throughout the whole century. At this point, one thing that also happens is that while literature in general had been up until now uh, a mostly a male-dominated avenue, with the increase of female literacy and partial economic emancipation, Almanac publishers started looking at women as potential, uh, a potential new public. Not only this, but given the large, uh, the cheapness, uh, period, large periodicity of these almanacs, women also start to look at this literary tradition as an avenue into uh, literary expression. <clears throat> and you start to get almanacs with an increasing number of female correspondents and contributors. This to the point with the rise of Portuguese, the Portuguese feminist movement, you then get almanacs which are not only, um, they are not only publishing the, the, the contents provided by women, but are themselves um, owned and directed by women. This is an, a historical one, the Almanac of the Ladies, which was an explicit feminist publication. However, on the other side of the trench, you also have other almanacs whose aim was to while still catering to a female audience, uh, underline the domestic and reproductive role of women. This is uh, one such almanac, the Almanac of the Kitchens. And these almanacs tended to always be associated in one way or another to um, Catholic associations. However, now at this point, there is an intersection between the almanac tradition and the tradition of books of St. Cyprian. In particular, between 1879 and 1921, we have a number of almanacs whose uh, main preoccupation seems to be the discussion of magic and occultism. These almanacs should be noted, they mostly start off as being simple republications of the content of the larger Cyprian books, but as time goes on and issues start following other issues, they start to uh, offer certain alterations on these previously existent uh, procedures say that there is a, a recipe for a love sorcery, uh, a certain ingredient will change or a certain word in an incantation will change and as time goes by each of these almanacs kind of evolves into its own style of magic. Among these we have for example the Almanac of the Sorceresses, the Almanac of the Witch of Ahuda, the True Almanac of the Sorceresses, the Almanac of Antimonica, the Almanac of Antimonica and Antimichaela, the Almanac of St. Cyprian, and the True Almanac of St. Cyprian. In particular, among all of these, um, these five can be pointed at as apparently presenting themselves uh, explicitly for a female audience. This is mostly evident by their title, such as the Almanac of the Sorceresses, or having in their title, or in presenting as their directors, uh, particular female magical practitioners, such as the Witch of Ahuda, Antimonica, and Antimichaela. Picking up on these two last almanacs, and also considering the true almanac of St. Cyprian, since all these three almanacs were published by the same publisher, collectively, these three almanacs seem to present um, a hidden underground of female magical practitioners, which they present as their contributors. However, this is likely um, somewhat of a falsehood. In all likeliness, these almanacs were uh, owned by, by men, directed by men, and their contributors, if there were any, since large portions of their material were taken from the Cyprian books, were themselves men. But still, they made a point to present themselves as being directed by women, um, their content being contributed by women, and having women as their main audience. Out of all of these characters that these almanacs present, Antimonica is the, the, the breakout character. She not only is presented as the director of these almanacs, but her name is the only one which, among all of them, is given a certain intrinsic magical virtue. Antimonica is actually 
portrayed as a spiritual entity that can be summoned by magical practitioners in the aid of magic. Uh, there are a few examples I can give. This is uh, an incantation for the conjuration of a storm present in the Almanac of Antimonica uh, from the, for the year of 1905. And this is a very complex procedure, it needs a human bone and everything, but at a certain point you summon a, a spiritual entity to aid you in bringing forth this storm, and that spiritual entity is none other than Antimonica. A different situation. <clears throat> this is an, an incantation for the, they're just supposed to say over a toad, and then you do some harm to this toad, and that harm is then transferred to somebody else, and the spiritual power you call upon to do this is Antimonica, but this is one of the procedures which is actually taken from a Cyprian book. And if we go at the original, we find that Antimonic is actually substituting the name Lucifer Prince Beelzebub. A different situation happens in this incantation which is meant to make a talisman out of the, the leg of an owl, once again you call it Antimonica, and in the original Antimonic is substituting the name of Saint Cyprian. And this overall seems to be the most common case. Another situation, this is an incantation for, for cartomancy that you're supposed to say before casting the card, and as, as I have mentioned, St. Cyprian is mostly associated with divination. And from the 19th century on, hydromancy um, falls out of fashion and cartomancy kind of takes over. And St. Cyprian is associated with that. But here, in the Almanac of Antimonica, instead of St. Cyprian, once again you call upon Antimonica. Similar situation, um, an incantation to make a talisman out of the leg of a chicken, Antimonica, substitutes St. Cyprian. Now, out of all of this, a few conclusions. The crossover of the Book of St. Cyprian and Almanac traditions generated a set of very particular literary objects, being produced in a time when women were looked upon by publishers as a new and desirable audience. This resulted in a set of almanacs dedicated to magic and occultism, which not only presented themselves as aimed at, the fe at female readers, but were themselves created and produced by women, putting forward a new idea of female identity. Even if potentially fraudulent in their claims, what these almanacs presented was a universe of powerful underground female magical practitioners who were described as economically emancipated repositories of power, authority and wisdom. Particular among these was the name of Auntie Monica, a supposed Lisbon witch who directed several almanacs and not only was a respected magical practitioner but was herself a powerful spiritual agency who could be petitioned for magical assistance and protection. In more than one sense, Auntie Monica was thus a female Saint Cyprian the Iberian magical hero. Thank you. I'm done.